What's up, Pitt fans? Welcome back to another Pitt Mailbag here on the Post-Gazette Sports Now YouTube channel. He is Chris Carter. I am Noah Hiles. Chris, week one of college football in the books. How are we feeling, buddy? How, how, how are we living? We're living great, man. Lots of great college football action across the board. Pitt had its game against Wofford, and now this week it gets real against Cincinnati. I love breaking down this one all week long. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Got a lot of questions about this upcoming matchup. But before we get to them, we need to talk about our show's presenting sponsor, which is Mike's Beer Bar on the North Shore. Whether you're in for a Steelers, Pirates, or Pit game, Mike's Beer Bar is right across the street from PNC Park and has the best selection of beer in town, as well as amazing food options. They have over 20 TVs, so you can catch all of your NFL, college football, Pirates, Penguins, Riverhounds, and Premier League action right at Mike's. Come on in and try one of their 500 different available beers, 300 of them being local craft beers, as well as their 80 different local craft beers available on tap. You can also get a flight to try out every option you can dream of. And trust me, you won't run out of favorites because I never do. And this other guy on the screen, he never does either. We've been there plenty of times. If you're hungry, you can try their steak on a stone, which is an awesome meal where you can choose how hot you want your steak cooked with a heated stone right in front of you as you enjoy a night out in Pittsburgh. Come to Mike's Beer Bar and get your sports fix experience at the best bar in Pittsburgh. A big thanks to all the fine folks at Mike's. As I say, uh, time and time again, Chris and I have spent many evenings at Mike's Beer Bar over on the North Shore. So and many more of, are coming. Yes, absolutely. Uh, speaking of things going on on the North Shore, Pitt, Hosting Cincinnati Saturday, and we're going to break that one down. But I actually like this question to start, Chris. Tony wants to know, which game will be more difficult for Pitt to win? Cincinnati this upcoming Saturday or West Virginia the following weekend? I feel like he, Tony feels like Cincinnati is the better team, but West Virginia on the road is never easy. You want to start with this one, Carter? So that's that's the thing here is that there is there are the aesthetics that I think that West Virginia presents that will make them a tough opponent. Just being in Morgantown, that's not easy. They're going to be amped up. It's the backyard brawl. They want to get pit back for what happened last year. But schematically, honestly, I point to the things that Cincinnati does through the air. I was not impressed by what West Virginia tried to do through the air against Penn State. Granted, that is Penn State, one of the best teams in the country, and they they, they did what they were supposed to do against uh, the Mountaineers. But I think if the, if you're going to attack this pit team this year, it's through the air and it's through the things that Cincinnati looked like it could do well in their opening game against Eastern Kentucky. And man, I, I think if if there's if there's a matchup problem, there's a few ones that they could poke at that will really test this pit secondary. So. I'm going to lean to Cincinnati simply because of X's and O's and their talent-wise. I think WVU atmosphere is going to be crazy, but I think Pitt's talent can pull them out that a little bit easier. I'll, I'll agree with you. Um, I do think the atmosphere is going to be nuts in Morgantown, but, I, I mean, you have a sixth-year quarterback. He, he should be prepared for things like that with Phil Dracovic. He should be prepared to be playing in hostile environments. You have – veterans on both sides of the football who have played in this rivalry game before. And while they haven't been in Morgantown, they've played in big games. They, I mean, the key guys on this, on this team still, most of them have won an ACC championship. They, they know what it's like to play in high stakes contests. Um, so I'm not going to just say West Virginia just because of the, the atmosphere, because if you look at it, I mean, Cincinnati put up 66 points last weekend. I don't know if West Virginia can score 66 points against any team in the country. Yeah. And that's, and that's not saying that they're terrible. It's just, I think Cincinnati's offense has an element of explosiveness to it. They have guys who, you know, earlier in their collegiate careers played at Florida, played at LSU guys who were big time high school recruits and played for in a big time conference. So I'm probably a little, I'm, I'm not probably, I'm a lot higher on the Cincinnati team. I, I the, don't get me wrong. These are both games Pitt should and needs to win if it's going to be viewed as, you know, a, a contender in the ACC. And I know this has nothing to do with the ACC standings, but you don't go out and lose one of these two games if you're going to be viewed as a serious team. You just don't. I agree. These I agree. are games that you you should win. And um, I think Pitt, Pitt will win both, but I think the tougher challenge, it's just also I think that uh, – there's an advantage to the West Virginia game because Pitt will have seen a legitimate opponent already where I think 
They haven't yet. They, they, they were they were just getting a nice little warm up round in against Wofford, and now they have to face a team that I think. I mean, I'm not expecting Cincinnati to make the college football playoff like it did a couple of years ago, but this is a team that can probably reach a bowl game. So take that for what you will. I don't think West Virginia is a team that will play in a bowl this year. On the note of Cincinnati's offense, is it is it worth any concern? that Cincinnati put up 66 points last week. And if not, why did Pitt only put up 45 against its FCS opponent? Um, I don't know if it's worth a concern. I think it is impressive, though. I mean, 66 points is tough to put up against whoever you're playing in yeah. college football. It means you're scoring a touchdown pretty much every possession you have the football. And if you're scoring 66, it means you're scoring quickly. You're not driving down the field, which is – exactly why Pitt didn't eclipse anything higher than 45 points. Because if you look, I mean, all of those, the Pitt's longest touchdown of the day was 39 yards. And that was with the backups. Prior to that, it was a 23 yard run by Phil Dracovic. This was a team that battled its way down the field. And that's just kind of how Frank Signetti's offense works. Um, I do think there is an additional explosive element here that maybe we didn't see. They, they just missed on a couple of deep balls. Uh, Saturday, but overall, I thought the offense looked fine. They probably weren't trying to show too much, and let's be real, I don't I don't think they were playing the best players at all times either. I, I think I think Rodney Hammond Jr. is probably going to get more than single digit carries against Cincinnati, yeah. which yeah. wasn't the case last year, and he might be able to break some runs that Daniel Carter didn't break or things of that nature. And I think they're just they have a lot more of a reason to be a little bit more aggressive. So that's why I think Pitt could have probably put up 66 if they really tried to, but that's not really how this offense works. And they kind of just wanted to work things out and, and feel it out and be comfortable. And that's what happened. But Cincinnati, yeah, they have some explosive players uh, and credit to them for, for lighting up the scoreboard. Carter, what says you? Uh, yeah. I mean, sure. That I think the big thing about this is, isn't as much about, Pitt's offense only putting up 45 points against its FCS opponent. It's more about Cincinnati is going to give you a real passing threat. You look at Emory Brown, the, the quarterback from uh, uh, from Cincinnati, threw five touchdowns and two different receivers. It wasn't like they just locked onto one superstar who just carried them through. And Pat Narduzzi even talked about this on Monday. Cincinnati's got receiving threats, and this is going to test what Pitt does in the secondary. I, I think you and I both, both agree all throughout training camp, one of the biggest questions we have about this team outside of Phil Dracovic are the safeties. They got two new starting safeties in, in the back, in the, in the secondary. And when you put them back there, they're going to be fine against a team like Wofford. But if a quarterback can challenge them, that this has been the Achilles heel for Pitt's defense is when a, a, pa a passing offense can come in, challenge them downfield, and, and, get, and get it past this secondary that leaves a lot of their guys on islands. And Javon McIntyre, uh, P.J. O'Brien, they did pretty good for their first game. They and Pat Narduzzi even acknowledged as much. And he said also Donovan McMillan had a really good, really good showing. But now they're going to go up against a team that tests them and tests uh, their uh, their discipline in playing their positions. If they hold up well, they should be fine. But if they don't, it'll be a big storyline after after this upcoming weekend. But again, I think that's the really cool thing to watch here. Yeah, I, I agree. And I mean, on the note of the secondary being challenged as we wrap up this one too. I mean they. They really didn't see a lot of passes because the guy couldn't even get the pass off. And, and I think Cincinnati is going to have an offensive line that can at least remotely come close to blocking Pitt's defensive line, which just really wasn't the case on Saturday with Wofford. We move forward now. Jacob wants to know, which new Pitt player were each of you most impressed with last week, aside from Phil Dracovic? This is an interesting question. Hmm. I'm going to – I'll say this for my answer. I'm going to go with Braylon Lovelace. Um, Ooh, okay. Okay. He didn't necessarily do anything amazing in the game, but it kind of it kind of blows my mind that this kid who was playing last year at this time at Leechburg High School is now one of the first freshmen we see on the field for the Panthers. I think he was the second freshman, true freshman, to touch the field Saturday behind Kenny Johnson. Kenny Johnson got a little bit of run with the starting offense. I think maybe like six or seven snaps max. Um, but Lovelace... I'm pretty sure got in there early in the or late in the second half or late in the first half, early in the second half, before a lot of the other reserves were on the field. 
that kid from Leechburg, Pennsylvania in class 1A is is playing at the same spot that guys like Shane Simon and Bengali yeah. Kamara are playing now. And so, I mean, I, I don't know. Like, I looked at Lovelace when he verbally committed to Pitt. I just said, well, that's a kid you got to redshirt because he hasn't played against maybe more than, what, four or five Division One players his whole life. And now you're going to expect him to come in and play immediately against a team full of them? I just thought that would be too big of a challenge for him. But just looking at the weight that he's put on and how he's been able to manage it and, and adjust to his new body, it's impressive. And a guy, and the guy's a football player. We heard his name all spring. We heard his name all camp. And uh, I wouldn't be shocked if he letters this year, which would be a tremendous accomplishment considering where he's come from. I hear you. For this new, do they have, literally have to be the first year that uh, this is they're doing for Pitt, or are these guys that you know getting their first like real action for Pitt? No, no, it can't be like DeAndre Jules or somebody. So you could choose a okay. transfer or a true freshman, or re- yeah, a true freshman. A true freshman. Because I was gonna yeah. say Sam Oak and Lola would be would be my pick if we're talking redshirt freshman. But let let's go let's go. I'll go with Donovan McMillan. Looking back at the tape, he did fit in really well at the safety position, and I, I thought that was a really good thing for Pitt to see. They need depth there. They need guys to be able to rotate because if a guy gets hurt, they need someone to step up. That's something that they've had for years. I remember when Eric Hallett first played against Florida State back in 2020, and that was his emergence when Paris Ford uh, opted out and said, "I'm done for the season," basically quitting on the team at, at that point. Um, you know, the, you know, you, you had him step up and then you had Brandon Hill step up. Uh, actually, Eric Hell was before that. I think that was when Brandon Hill stepped up was when, yeah. when Paris Ford got hurt. But e- either way, both of those guys are ready. And now this year you got Javon McIntyre and P. D. O'Brien. They've been waiting for their chance. And now you got this new transfer in Donovan McMillan and he looked good. That's a really good sign for Pitt's secondary. So good on him for, for, for a good showing. Eileen wants to know anything on Sean Fitzsimmons. I wasn't sure if he played or not Saturday. Didn't see his name on the defensive stat sheet. I saw you mention he was dressed, but off to the side. So we can answer this question, but I think it's also just something worth noting on like the subject as a whole. Yeah, Sean, Sean was banged up. Uh, he, he did not play. He dressed, but during warmups, he was standing off to the side. Right. And um, this is just something that Pitt does. It, it you don't get an injury report in college football. And so the only time we know if a guy's injured is if we see him walking around with his ankle taped up or his knee wrapped up or on crutches or in an arm sling around the practice facility. And so every game day we're sitting up there in the press box while they're doing warmups and we're looking for guys in their jerseys, but in sweatpants on the sideline, that's how we find out the injury report. And so you're going to see more stuff like this. I mean, Fitzsimmons, from what I've heard, it's nothing incredibly serious. Uh, I, I wouldn't be sh- – I mean, maybe next week, maybe Saturday, it's the same thing where he's on the sidelines and he's not ready to go. But I, I, I'd expect him to play relatively soon overall, especially if, if they had him in pads. Normally, that's the thing they do the week prior to you being ready to play is they let you dress and then go through warm-ups and then you're just on the sideline. We saw them do that with with Rodney Hammond last year, Izzy last year, a whole bunch of defensive players. So, yeah. I mean, Carter, what, what do you think? I, I mean, is, is, is that something that you take into account too, where you see a guy where, you know, we know he might be a little banged up, but if he's at least dressing, that that's something where it's, it's not going to be a super long-term injury? Yeah, if he's dressing, that means that means that he could have been ready if this was probably a big time game. And Pitt's done that a lot over the years, especially when they're playing teams that are from the FCS. I think we saw that with a few players at Rhode Island, like you mentioned. But like you know, I think it might have even been a situation from what I've heard that like it might have been like a, like a hey, if you wake up and things are going the right way, you'll you'll play you'll play Saturday. Up oh, maybe you weren't a hundred percent. Why risk you getting us another uh, uh, worsening this injury when you can be back maybe you know at at ninety five percent instead of maybe a seventy five percent when Pitt does need you against Tennessee? So made sense to me to just rest him. It, it wasn't like they needed him uh, against Wofford, yeah. DeAndre Jules, and that defensive line eight people alive. So uh, you know I, I think I think you know it stinks that you didn't get to see him in that action, but don't worry, Sean Fitzsimmons is coming. Yeah. 
it, he's gonna he's gonna have his presence felt. And um, if there's one game to miss, it's it's Wofford. So I think 55 is gonna be all right. So we'll move forward now with our last question of the day. This one comes from Lee, and it's not about football but basketball. What can either of you tell us about Pitt's new guard, Michael Hewitt Jr.? Will he actually play at all this season? Nope. You should, uh, you should not should. hope that he does. <laughs> and no, I mean, look, the way the Dior stuff unfolded, and we'll, and I, like I said last week, we, we have a, another story on that coming out here soon. Um, th- th- Jeff didn't have any other options. Like, yeah, you, you, you have limited guys available, and when you're looking to fill a roster spot, this this is what you this is what you have to work with. This is what is on the table for you. And, and I'm sure Michael Hewitt Jr. was a fine high school basketball player. And I'm sure the reason they added him is he'll be a good teammate. This is some this is a body at practice that can push your guys and 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 challenge them. And a guy who probably has an interesting journey, considering that he's played for two different division one programs in a division two school. Uh, but I mean, you look at the numbers, he's never averaged over. He, he's never averaged double digits in scoring in his right. collegiate career. He's never played at a power five conference. Right. Right. Our power six for college basketball. So I, I don't know what value he adds other than you now have enough scholarship players to run five on five at practice. I think that and, might be the thing that he raised. Yeah. And that's, that's really what his purpose is this year. I think. I mean, KJ Marshall, that was a big reason why, you know, he was so helpful to the team was, you know, you knew that he wasn't going to come in and light it up for anybody, but like him and Aiden Fish, they needed guys who could run the scout team and to push it, to push the players. Um, So, and, you know, that was something that Dior Johnson was able to help with a little bit when he came back last year. So uh, having a guy like him, you know, I know I think he, he, he shot like 37%. I like that from three, you know, if he can, if he can come in on, on an occasional game and like hit a three pointer, like that would be nice. But like at the end of the day, if Pitt needs this guy, they're in a lot of trouble. But again, it's, it, this isn't an indictment of the program. It's just like you said, the situation that, that Jeff's in, he had to go, he had to make some sort of move, at least get this scholarship used, uh, brought in a guy who's been playing D2 ball, who had played D1 ball and maybe has, you know, the size that they want at guard just to test uh, how this, uh, how this group's going to play this year. You know, we'll see how that works out. Uh, but the bottom line is, no, don't expect Hewitt to play. This is still going to be a uh, Carlton Carrington, Jalen Lowe, Blake Henson led uh, led group. Uh, so I, I would not be sh- I would not be shocked if this guy plays less than 30 minutes on the whole year. Yeah. And, and the reality is you don't want to be adding someone who's going to be a key piece. Right. This late in the game. This late into. The, yeah. Your, your season starts. Yeah. In a couple in a couple of months, so you you want your team chemistry built by now. You you want, and they have that. They had they had a team trip to Spain. They've been working out together all summer. Throwing another key piece into that puzzle is not a good idea, unless if it's someone where their talent is undeniable, and that's not what this is. So you you just get a, a depth move, like Carter said. I I don't see this guy playing very much at all. Maybe he'll get some minutes early in the season against some of their weaker non-conference opponents. So that's all I got, Carter. Any final thoughts before we wrap this one up? Just to remind y'all to go to post-gazette.com to get all our content. Uh, Noah did a great job writing up what Pat Narduzzi said said on Monday at his press conference. We had a film study on what made Phil Nikovic look different than Keaton Slovis, even, even in just his first appearance. And we'll have a lot more breaking it down throughout the week. Lots of matchup stuff coming with Cincinnati and what Pitt has to look out for Saturday to stay unbeaten heading into the backyard brawl. All right, you heard the man. Check it all out at post-gazette.com. Hit that subscribe button as well to check out all of our YouTube content on the Post Gazette Sports Now YouTube channel and our podcast network for Chris Carter. I'm Noah Hiles signing off saying we'll see you around next time. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you enjoyed the video, please like it and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out our Apple Podcast channel for more podcast content. Click below for a special deal of 99 cents for a three-month subscription to the Pittsburgh Post Gazette.